Thank you, Bill. Yes, I'm here to review the latest magazine, and it is this one. It features Mirabai Star on the cover. Mirabai Star being an American um, spiritual leader. Mirabai grew up in a spiritual community called the Lama Foundation in New Mexico. This foundation honored all faiths. And I'll, I'll actually quote from her here. I grew up exposed to all the major branches of Buddhism from the wide windswept emptiness of Japanese Zen to the lush layers of Vajrasana, Buddhism's tantric path. In our family, we honored Jesus as a great rabbi and consulted the I Ching, the Chinese book of divination when we had an important decision to make. At any given time, there might be a sadhu, that is a wandering holy man from India sitting at our kitchen table next to an, an, in, an indigenous elder from the Pueblo of New Mexico. I thought that was normal. We didn't have television. I didn't have access to middle-class American culture and I didn't know any better. That's why I am the way I am. Mirabai runs sacred feminine workshops in which she honors the sacred feminine figures such as, and there's quite a list from around the world and through various times and cultures. Shekinah, who is the feminine face of God in the Jewish tradition. Mary, mother of Jesus. Mary Magdalene. Miriam, son of Moses. Saint Teresa of Avila, a Catholic nun who lived in the 16th century Spain. Julian of Norwich, the English An Anchorus from the Middle Ages, and various Sufi poets. She also features mother and daughter Demeter and Persephone from Greek mythology, Kuan Yin from the Chinese Buddhist tradition, and Kali, the fierce Hindu goddess. So she reflects in her classes the many faces of the sacred feminine. She makes a distinction between interfaith, which she sees as a beautiful peacemaking activity, which builds tolerance and, and interspiritual, which is a direct experience of the divine through the portal of various faiths. She likes to be able to attend a Catholic mass one day and have what she calls a direct experience of the beloved, and the next day go to a mosque and participate transcendentally in a Sufi chant. She sees herself like a bee going from flower to flower, pollinating and making honey to feed the world. She says that we should take advantage of technology, which can give us access to transmissions from across the religious and spiritual landscape which of course I'm sure many of us are doing. She also speaks about sacred activism. She says, if we are blessed with a sense of oneness that deep meditation brings and therefore know that all is one, then that brings an invitation to rise up and act when we see injustice because what affects one affects the many. But with sacred activism, she believes that, or her experience is that um, having that sacred connection gives her the strength to carry on, whereas a lot of activists get burnt out through their anger and their sense of despair. She also talks about the, last, the dark side of the feminine and references St. John of the Cross when we can no longer rely on comforting practices to console us and we need to surrender to a state of not knowing. Another article I have here is by Philip Goldberg. And it's called Rethinking the Borders of Spirit. I don't know if you can see that, that's better. When we think about classifying religious belief or experience, we usually describe it by naming religions such as Christian, uh, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, etc., and many others. 
However, he proposes a different concept. One day he was in Santa Monica, California, when he saw a group of Hare Krishnas chanting on the sidewalk in their saffron robes. And they were chanting and chanting, working themselves into an ecstatic state. And then along came, surprisingly, a group of Hasidic Jews, men dressed in black hats and black suits. And they, in fact, started chanting their own chants, not in competition, but just as a celebration of their devotion. And he realized that the ecstatic Hasids might have more in common with the Hare Krishnas than with mainstream Jews, while the ecstatic Krishnas might have more in common with the Hasids than with the mainstream Hindus. So there was that sort of crossover. And he believed that common thread was that both the groups had entered into a state of devotional ecstasy through their chanting, and that actually united them, even though their faiths were worlds apart. So he proposes groupings, which are actually based on spiritual practices taken from a yoga tradition, which has its pathways to enlightenment. Now, we would probably all be familiar with the, um, the physical practices of yoga, you know, the positions, the postures, the asanas, they're called. That's actually called Hatha yoga. But there are actually other types of yoga which go back many, many centuries. Firstly, we have the, the path called the Bhakti yoga, B-H-A-K-T-I, which is the path of the heart and the devotional, which I've just described through the Hare Krishnas and the Hasids. Then we have Karma yoga, which is the path of action or selfless service depicted by Mother Teresa and Gandhi, for example. Yana yoga, which is the path of the mind or study, which is reflected in the life of someone like Thomas Merton and many others. And Raja yoga, which is the path of prayer or meditation, practitioners of which are found in every religious tradition. So you may like to reflect on which path you are now following, if that works for you, and if that has changed over your lifetime. And finally, we have the Unity Masters page. And this time it features John Royal Fillmore, whom some of you may already be familiar with. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore had three children, four boys. Lowell, the oldest, was born in 1882, who, and he wrote for and edited Weekly Unity for more than 60 years. Waldo, born two years later, created the master architectural plan for Unity Village in, in an Italianate style. John Royal, who was known as Royal, was born in 1889. He loved writing and teaching unity to children. He published his first piece in We Wisdom when he was 10. And after graduating from the University of Missouri, he became its, uh, a managing director of We Wisdom, a publication for children. He was also a staunch advocate of vegetarianism. Unfortunately, he experienced very poor health for much of his life which worth, worsened after the death of his wife shortly after childbirth, having given birth to their only child. In September 1923, he admitted himself into a sanatorium with diabetes, arteriosclerosis and high blood pressure. And I will read you his final note to his family. Father, I am reading Christian healing again and studying it. Mother, I'm so sorry about what I said last Sunday. Grandma, you got away without kissing me goodbye. I'll come home, send me magazines. Sadly, he died a few days later, age 30. And I'd like to finish by just reading a short excerpt from one of his poems. The world may change, 
and time its hours spend. Eternities may pass, but a friend is still a friend. What matters if without, there are many faults may be. I care not for all this, he is the friend to me. The ocean wide may lie between and lands may set apart, but still he dwells as ever, his image in my heart. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for preparing that for us. Fascinating, isn't it? They say that um, unity is uh, culturally Christian, yet spiritually ethnic. And we can see that when we study the history of unity and new thought. Diane, thank you. Let's thank her once more for that. And we look forward to the next Unity Magazine review when it occurs. Thank